Hello, I'm Peter Curti, a research fellow at the CIS, and it's a great pleasure to have your company this evening for a conversation about ethics, choices, and the common good. When we make a moral choice, we embrace one course of action to the exclusion of others. Increasingly, the choices we make about how to live are expressed in terms of asserting individual rights. While our choices may express our own preferences and beliefs, they also have an impact on others, including the wider society and the common good. Making choices is never as simple as we might like to think. In a world made more complex by advances in medicine, science and technology, how do we go about the business of choosing what is right and good? And how do we balance our own preferences against those of others when there is conflict? Well, to discuss the challenge of doing ethics in the public square and of balancing respect for the autonomy of the individual, I'm joined by Professor Margaret Somerville. Margaret Somerville is Professor of Bioethics at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, and Emerita Professor of Law and Professor in the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University in Montreal. She's also Emerita Founding Director of the Centre for Medicine, Ethics and Law at McGill. She's published extensively and is a frequent commentator on issues of law and bioethics. Her most recent book is Bird on an Ethics Wire, Battles About Values in the Culture Wars. Margaret Somerville, thank you very much for joining me this evening. It's my pleasure, Peter. Thank you for inviting me. Well, let me begin by asking you about some of the language that we'll be using in this conversation. By the term ethics, I mean broadly the theory of right and wrong, and morals is the word I'm using to describe how we put that theory into practice. Now, Socrates said that we are talk, what we're talking about here is how one should live. If each one of us is responsible for answering Socrates' question for ourselves, what's the problem with answering that the best way for me to live is to do at any given time what I want to do at that time? Oof. <laughs> well, I think that's one strand of, that we include in our analysis of what we need. Um, I think that currently um, we've gone too far towards what is being called expressive individualism. Sometimes the alternative terms for it are radical or intense individualism. And that would say exactly what you just said, that, you know, what's right for me is right, full stop. And that's what I'm going to do. But there's a lot of work going on at the moment about why that's an inadequate sort of uh, map for living our lives if we want to live the fullest possible human life and, and experience what is called sometimes human flourishing. And that's a very difficult term to describe because it's, a, it's an experience and it, it probably differs for every person. And the reason why the, what it, the intense individualism doesn't work is because, and probably from my point of view, I think we're probably genetically programmed, uh, but whether we are or not, or whether we develop this characteristic, we're social animals. We need other people. And I still remember um, reading in um, uh, the book for, uh, Four Essays on Liberty by Isaiah Berlin. And this, this was when I was doing my PhD, which was in the mid-1970s, so it's a long time ago. And he said, I am what I see of myself in other people. And so we're not isolated atoms, you know, spinning around in a vacuum. We live and the non-vacuum that we talk about is society. And in order both to create and maintain a flourishing society, a healthy society, uh, we have to create the glue that we can all agree is that we can, and that is the story, the values, the attitudes, the beliefs, the behaviours, that we all say, uh, I accept that and I buy into it, and we encourage each other 
to accept it. And in doing that, we bond to each other and form a society. And I think uh, today uh, we are so divided and we are fragmented, which is even more than being divided. We've got all these little pockets of people who focus perhaps on one issue and don't uh, look at the whole and don't consider that, who believe that the right to autonomy trumps everything else and who don't consider what you have to maintain to maintain the common good, that bonding, that glue that binds us in society. So I've been doing quite a lot of thinking and writing on that in my recent work. So really these are, you're referring to external factors that have an impact on the, the, the ways in which we make moral choices. Um, and it could be social convention, it could be the law, it could be the decisions made by others. Given those constraints, how helpful is the idea of acting out of self-interest when it comes to living in an ethical life? Given what you've just said, wouldn't he be better off if self-interest was not actually a factor at all in ethical decision-making? No, I think it has to be because I think it's it's probably a survival instinct that you, you act in your self-interest in order to survive. And I think what we where we've gone off, off center is that we need a constant balancing of self-interest and the common good. And what we've done is we've gone too far to the self-interest, which is, I guess, another term that you could use for autonomy or personal, only personal preference. And we have to consider what uh, demanding that and implementing that, what harm that does to these uh, experiences and forces and values that bind us. And that's where the common good comes in. You know, my students ask me what I mean by the common good, and I've been looking up definitions of it. But I think one, uh, this is an analogy that I thought of. It's intangible, so that makes it difficult to get a hold on. But if you think about, I don't know whether they still do this, but I'm sure they probably do, that when you sell a business or you sell a med medical practice or a pharmacy, I used to be a pharmacist, so this is how I know about this, you, you actually add on to the price of it, you know, to have the building, the equipment, all the things you need, but you add on an amount of money for the goodwill. And that goodwill is that people trust you, they come to you, you help them, you accommodate them when they're in trouble. And I think that can be looked at as what we mean by the common good in society. It's that we're all in this together. And, you know, that's the slogan from COVID. And I think COVID showed us most dramatically how we really are all in this together. And we have to think not only about our own wishes and well-being, but also that of others and to, to protect and safeguard them as well. But given what you said about the common good, why do these myriad constraints that, that together, as it were, form the, 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 the cohesive glue, why do they, how do these constraints <clears throat> get their moral authority? Because in a society like Australia's, we have very different conceptions of law, we have different beliefs about, uh, about God. Doesn't the variety of belief and the, and the variety of, uh, of opinion weaken the claim that these ethical constraints do have a moral authority? What's the basis of, what's the moral authority that undergirds the common good? Uh, I mean, the alternative to thinking that there is such a thing as the common good and that there are legitimate moral restraints is anarchy. And I don't think any reasonable person wants to live in an anarchic, chaotic society. And I have thought about that, Peter, 
because I think it's a real challenge to how do you establish that we should all agree with this. And what I've written a lot about for the last 20 years is that I believe that whether or not we're religious, and if we're religious, no matter which religion we belong to, we've all got what I call a human spirit. And that human spirit is a sense that there's something greater than me. It doesn't have to be God and it need not be religious and it need not involve a supernatural belief, but that I am not the only atom on this planet. And that, and from a selfish point of view, that unless I consider what other humans, and I would go broader than that, I'd say humans, animals, and the environment need for their protection, I ultimately will not be protected and will not flourish. And uh, that human spirit is, you know, as you know, because I know you know some of my work, it's, it's to do with looking out at the night sky and being amazed at thinking that we're this tiny little planet in this great universe and that we, that we don't know very much about it. And that the more that we know through our wonderful science, the more that we know that we don't know. And, that, and if we respect that unknowing, with the appropriate humility, I think that we do come to the conclusion that we need uh, this bonding to, to other people, to our world, to the universe. So it sounds as though we could describe morality almost as a social institution, this check against uh, against anarchy that you referred to, against what Thomas Hobbes would have, uh, how he would have described human life as being solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Without that social institution of morality, uh, we would have uh, chaos and very dangerous chaos. Yeah, I, and I think, Peter, that, uh, you know, the movements in human rights a lot, and even humanism, where the people are not religious, and I think they sense that. And I think that we also sense in other people that we share that human spirit. I mean, one of the ways that I've talked about this, for example, in relation to climate change, uh, is that we... Uh, we have to have this sense of wonder about the world that we inhabit. And then I think that we, we have to put that into practice by acting not to destroy that world. And, and I think you can do that whether you are religious or not religious or whatever you are. And one of the uh, proposals I made some time ago, and it got me into an awful lot of trouble, I proposed that everybody needed to be able to see that some things or realities ought to be regarded as sacred. Now, sacred means it must not be laid waste or wantonly destroyed. And so what I, what I devised was that we could have two concepts of the sacred, the religious sacred for people who are religious and the secular sacred for those who are not, that they could believe. And I think we do see this in a lot of people who are not religious but care deeply about animals and the planet and the environment and that. And... Um, that, uh, you know, that they also needed to know what they wanted to hold sacred and that we could find a lot more connections if we crossed over those two sacreds. And uh, anyway, I got into terrible trouble because the religious people were furious with me. They said I was denigrating the sacred in religion and the secular people were absolutely furious with me because they said I was trying to impose religion on them. And one of my students heard this and he came up to me and he said something that I, I really think about a lot. 
He said, you know, Professor Somerville, when you've got absolutely everybody mad at you, you might be onto something important. And you know what, I've treasured that statement because I think it's really important. And I think that's the other thing that I try to do. And I think there's a lot of people coming to the realisation that many more of us need to do this, is to find the connections between the what are currently opposing sides or divides. And, and I mean, one of those connections is that religion and science are not antithetical. Depending on how you view the new science, it can actually augment a sense of what I would call a religious or mystical belief. And, and also this idea that mystical or mystery uh, or myth are false is wrong. It's just we humans using the only way that we can communicate, which is to find words or sometimes music or the arts like painting, uh, to communicate these, you know, metaphysical, intangible realities. But just because we don't communicate them very well doesn't mean they don't exist. So I really don't have a problem with, uh, you know, not uh, with thinking that you could only believe the things I believe if you believe in God. I do believe in God, but that's not the reason I believe these things. I'd like to pursue this idea of the of the cohesive um, power, the cohesive force of the of the common good. We've got a question from one of our viewers, Jeffrey Bullock, who asks whether there's a definition that you could offer of the common good that might persuade uh, a majority of people, or might be might have this cohesive, uh, persuasive force that you you speak about in order to get people, as it were, to to follow or to subscribe to it. How would you define common good in that sense? Oh, Peter, you should have warned me of this because I've actually just given a speech on why have we lost our protection of the common good. And in that I gave some definitions and they're all very, they're various. But what they amount to, I think, is this. Um, there was a book by the philosopher, uh, I've forgotten his first name, his last name's Putman, and he wrote a book called Bowling Alone, and it was about how America had become just intense individuals, sort of all isolated from each other. And there's a great deal of angst about that at the moment, and people are trying to do something to close the divides. But he's got a definition of common good, and that's why I use um, that uh, analogy to goodwill, because it's like that. It's all of the relationships that we have and need as a member of a community or a society and the things that we feel that just because we are human, we owe to each other, that you don't have to agree to um you know, pay for some education for poor children or something like that. Mm. So, so mm -hmm. the the idea for it's, it's the other word for it that some people use, although I don't like it, is social capital. That just as you can have monetary capital in a society, you can have this reservoir of goodwill and caring and fulfilling obligations that you haven't individually agreed to, but you have them because you're human and there are other humans in need or there are some other things that are goods. For example, leaving a world to future generations in which reasonable people will want to live. I mean, I'm very worried at the moment and I'm particularly worried about this in the euthanasia context, that we've, there's just a absolute in, incredible increase in the use of euthanasia in Canada. And I'm, you know, I'm very familiar with that society because I lived there for 41 years and been involved in these issues. And I'm, what has happened is euthanasia has been normalised. It's only been enforced for four years. 
And uh, now, you know, when it came into force, everybody said, oh, no, it will never expand. It will be strictly controlled. Uh, the latest figures are something like 23,000 people have been euthanized in Canada. And um, the rate is increasing. And not only that, there's legislation before the Canadian Parliament to uh, extend access to it. And the latest development is that the Parliament has passed a bill which will allow people who've got no physical illness, but they're mentally ill, and they will be able to access euthanasia. They are currently considering whether you can give an advanced directive so that if you get Alzheimer's and you can't consent to being killed, your di advanced directive, like a living will, will tell the doctor you can give this person a lethal injection. They're also looking at euthanasia for children. And uh, actually somebody who is, she's a bioethicist and lawyer at the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, and she's my former student, so I don't think I did a very good job teaching her. But she, she and colleagues have just written, or they've written a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine of a protocol for giving euthanasia to children. So, oh, and I've recently uh, published an article in the Lynn Acre Quarterly Journal uh, um, called, Does It Matter How We Die? The Combination of Euthanasia and Organ Transplants, because Several jurisdictions, including Canada, are taking organs from euthanized people for transplant. And they're getting the consent either of the family or the person before they die. But the essay I write was meant to try to shock people into seeing what euthanasia is. Uh, and that was that if you agree with taking organs after a euthanasia death, why not give the person a general anesthetic and, and sort of carry out the euthanasia by removing their vital organs, take out their beating heart, take out their breathing lungs, take out their kidneys or whatever liver that you want, and they'll be in much better condition than if you kill them first and then take the organs. Now, most people, including those who agree with euthanasia, were absolutely horrified by this suggestion. And what I asked them to do was to consider why they were horrified. What was it about this that they couldn't accept? And so, and you know, I just think that I left that as an open question. But what I was hoping is that they'd have a more realistic view of what euthanasia really is. I mean, it's killing, it's intentionally killing people. That's what it is. And it's sweeping across Australia, even as we speak, uh, with moves now in the New South Wales Parliament to, to, to legalise it here. It's a very um, a contentious and, and a divisive topic. Margaret, I'd like just to come back to the question of disagreement, which you, you touched on earlier, about the disagreements we have. You mentioned different conceptions of the sacred and how this provoked disagreement between people. How do we handle disagreements um, in in about what it is that constitutes uh, the common good, because this arises, I think, in particular when moral claims are turned into rights claims. A moral claim to equal treatment turns into a rights claim to be treated equally. Um, how do we account for the confusion? How do you account for the confusion that prevails about the difference between equality on the one hand and equity on the other? Yeah, well, equality means treating everybody the same, although it is often used in a way that incorporates the doctrine of equity, and equity means fairness. Now, fairness might involve not treating everybody exactly the same. And in an article I wrote recently that was in the Weekend Australian, I explained that 
if you've got three people uh, who are outside an opaque fence with a cricket game going on on the oval, one of them is quite tall, one of them is medium height, and one of them is short. Now, if you give them all a box to stand on that is the same height, the tall person can see the game, the middle person and the short person can't. On the other hand, if you give them three boxes, which go to what increase in height do they need in order to see the game, the tall person gets a small box, the middle person gets a middle-sized box, and the, the short person gets a large-sized box, and then they all see the game. Now, that's fairness, but it's not equality in terms of what you give to them. I mean, you could argue that it's equality in terms of the outcome that they all see the game. But it's really uh, important that we look at both of those aspects. And um, to, but to come back to uh, how do we deal with this, how do we deal with division and conflict? I try to teach the students that when you've got a difficult issue and you know that there are people with very strong views on either side of that issue, you should try to start off from where you agree. And very often in ethics, applied ethics, we don't. We leap straight into the conflict uh, about where we disagree. And um, start, for example, if you take euthanasia, it's a good example. Um, where, uh, I mean, where we, pro-euthanasia says, let's legalize lethal injections or a physician assisted suicide. Anti-euthanasia says, no, that's wrong. That's intentionally killing another human being. And that is fundamentally wrong, no matter how much good you want to do. Now, if you come back behind that debate and say, where do we agree in the euthanasia situation? We agree that we all want to relieve suffering. None of us wants to see people suffer. Uh, and we both have that goal of not allowing people to suffer. And in experiencing that agreement, we can have an experience of all belonging to the same moral universe where we move to the disagreement as to, is, as to what are the acceptable ways of relieving suffering. And pro-euthanasia says, well, uh, giving a lethal injection is acceptable. Anti-euthanasia says, no, we've got to have the very best palliative care, uh, which can ultimately relieve all suffering because you can use what's called palliative sedation. You do have to be careful with that because sometimes it's used as what's called even in some legislation, for example, in Quebec, in Canada, slow euthanasia, where the person is deliberately put into a deep sleep and um, is just left there with no support or that until they die. But, uh, you know, there are ways to deal with these things. Now, why would we do, why would we sort of use palliative sedation instead of giving a lethal injection? First of all, because the precedent it sets that you it is ethically acceptable to terminate intentionally terminate a human life, the damage that that does to the value of respect for human life, which has to be upheld at two levels, both in relation to individuals and in relation to society in general. And why euthanasia is so dangerous in those respects is that it, it changes the rules that govern both law and medicine. It tell, the law is changed to say this is allowed. Medicine is given authority to do the killing. Now, in a secular society, as compared with a religious one, where the value in a religious society, usually the value of respect for human life is carried by religion. 
but in a secular society, it's carried by the institutions of law and medicine. And so what you've got is very serious damage to the value of respect for life at a societal level. And I think we can, well, I mean, I know the Canadian situation very well. I also know quite a bit about the European situation, and we can definitely see that occurring in those jurisdictions. It's a loss of respect for human life. You know, it's no big, in fact, I've recently had a consult from people who were distraught and the way they, they'd they been present at a, a close relative's euthanasia death. And this woman was healthy. She wasn't dying, but she just decided she had enough and she wanted euthanasia. And these people went along with it, including one who was an Anglican priest who was very unsure about it, but not openly anti-euthanasia. And the reason they asked if they could speak to me because they wanted me to explain to them what I thought was wrong about euthanasia because they felt they had a terrible experience. And the way that, and the euthanasia was very, as one one of the people said, it was so mechanistic. It was just like the doctor came down and said, okay, you know, put out your arm and put the cannula in and gave this person a lethal dose. And the other word, and I thought this was really interesting, the other word that they kept using was it was so casual. It was casual, you know. It was like this is no big deal. We're going to make you dead, which is what you're doing. So, you know, it's a, it's a big issue. It's a big issue. And I think that's what you, and why is the common good connected with that? Because the people who most object to this are people with disabilities. And they say, hey, you know, they're killing people who've got the same condition as I have. And I don't feel safe. And I don't feel it's respectful of me. And they also go on to say, I feel it tells me I'm worthless. It tells me I've got a life not worth living. And I think, and I've got incredible admiration for the courage and stoicism and activism of the disability community. And there's an amazing community of them in Canada. And um, they've got, they really have lobbied hard against this with almost no success. So, you know, it's tough. Margaret, I'd like to bring you back to the, uh, to the article you referred to in the Weekend Australian, because that was, a, I think, a very important article. And it raises one of the issues where competing claims about equality have come into conflict uh, in recent times, particularly in recent weeks during the election campaign. And that is uh, the, the place of uh, the, the, the issue of transgender women competing in sport. And to to be precise about this, as you yourself have remarked, a transgender woman is a biological male with a female gender. Now, before we go on, I just want to be clear um, for, for people who are watching that I don't want to get into the question of whether or not transgender competitors ought to compete. What I want to focus on is, if you like, the, the meta ethical question of how we approach the challenge of weighing competing claims. And in that article uh, in which you address some of those meta-ethical questions, you remark that the issue throws us into what is sometimes called a world of competing sorrows. That was a real phrase that really struck me. What did you mean by it? Yeah, you know, it's it, pro, in, in doing applied ethics, or it's called bioethics, Um, When everybody agrees on what the ethical uh, stance is, you usually don't have an ethical problem. So most of what we talk about in ethics is where there is conflict, where people don't agree on what the ethical stance is. And, And a world of competing sorrows comes out in those situations. And what it means is, that there is no no harm option. And so in the situation of transgender women in sport, 
The two competing harms are the exclusion of transgender women from playing in a sport with a gender label that they uh, feel they belong to, and the, uh, the harm to the uh, women who are not transgender uh, because they are not competitive with the transgender woman. And there's some really interesting science. There's a couple of new papers actually out uh, about why they're not competitive. And the answer is that men's bodies are different. They're stronger. They've got many, much more muscle mat, mass. They um, just going through male puberty makes them much superior in athletic terms as compared with women. And so what you then end up with is that you've got to make a choice on, on whom you inflict harm. Should you say to the transgender women, no, you can't compete because it's not fair to the people, to the women who have women's bodies, uh, biological bodies, um, or should you say to the biological women, you know, we can't discriminate, we mustn't exclude these people, and they're making claims that they've got the right to be treat, fully, treated fully as women. So that's the problem. And so what you have to do then, and this is where we don't, will not agree, because you have to look at what the values are, what the, all of, the good facts are essential to good ethics. And so we've got to try to get the best facts we can, which in these cases involves quite a lot of scientific evidence. And um, it mustn't be a bigoted or biased decision. It's got to be a decision that's fair and openly uh, rationalised because what happens when you get those competing values you've got to choose what your priority value is. And the essence of doing ethics is being able to justify the prioritization that you choose because choosing that prioritization hurts somebody else. And there's another concept in ethics that I like very much and it's called moral regret. And that is that when you do hurt somebody else because of what you believe to be ethical and that you believe you have to stand up for and promote as ethical, hurt somebody else. You don't just say bad luck or that's your problem. You say, I truly regret that my decision hurt you, but I feel I, that's the decision that ethically I must make. And I've had quite a lot of those situations because I've got more conservative values, not entirely by any means, but more conservative values, uh, which, you know, then hurts people who don't have those values. This recognition that we have different points of view and different values and the concept of moral regret conflicts quite significantly with the way in which we do ethics very often, it seems to me at the moment, where ethics has become increasingly a zero-sum game, where the people who claim to be right about something dismiss their opponents as being wholly wrong. And it seems to me that what we've lost is a sense of the ambiguity of the social and cultural and political arrangements of society. How do we come to terms with the partiality of our own explanations and, and in a way the ambiguity of human existence that allows for um, a, a, a moral regret and allows for uh, another phrase that you've used as well, which is moral humility. Yep. Yeah, I think moral humility is very important. Um, I think, well, let's look at what moral humility is. Moral humility has got three components. The first one is always to be conscious of your own moral fallibility, that you can make mistakes, that what you think is moral, and later on you might change your mind and say, no, I was wrong. That, that wasn't a good decision. It was immoral. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing is that you've got to respect the other person who doesn't agree with you and listen to their moral reasoning and try to understand it. And then, uh, and, and also I think to recognize that everybody, whichever of those two people you are, that you've got biases of which you are unaware. They're unconscious. And there's also scientific research going on on this about how we actually make moral decisions. And uh, it's been able to be shown that we do have these unconscious biases. So I think we have to keep that in mind. The idea that even though I firmly believe this and I believe it's what we should do, I always could be wrong. And most of the ethical issues that we're dealing with where there are problems, they are in a gray area. And then the third compo component of moral humility is to think beyond yourself, to engage in transcendence, which means the feeling of belonging to something larger than yourself and that what you do doesn't only matter to you, it matters to others. And I think it, if we... Go ahead. If we, we, you know, if we try to be conscious of that, I think it's the, we won't necessarily always be right, but I think it's the best chance of being ethical. And when you refer to the transcendent, which sort of moves us beyond the, the, the reasoned and precise use of, use of language, which we associate with, with ethical discourse, this brings us to what you've described, we've already touched on in the conversation, this sense of amazement and wonder and awe uh, as a way of helping us to find meaning and purpose in human life. Now, you've written a, a, a very interesting paper where you refer to something called the wonder equation and explain how you think use of the equation can help us wrestle with complex moral questions. What is the wonder equation and how do we encourage cultivation of a sense of amazement and wonder and awe? You know, when I wrote, I, I really never expected that article to get published, but it did in a pretty prestigious journal called Ethics and Behaviour. And um, one of my colleagues, this was a colleague at McGill, who was very supportive of me. He was the Dean of Law, actually. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Margot, he said, you're dangerously on the edge of total flake. And uh, I sort of appreciated that. I thought, well, that's right. But what it is, um, I, it's an experience of transcendence. It, it's like you look out at the night sky and you see the stars and you sort of experience what I would call the music of the stars, particularly when you're in the outback in Australia. It's a wondrous experience. And then you think that um, every atom in our body is billions of years old and it comes from, from outer space. And I often think, I wonder where my atoms have been before. And, you know, I mean, that's an amazing fact. And then I think that the way that, that nature and the way that the universe, you know, holds together in that. I mean, you can, if you really think about it and experience it, uh, you can't do anything else except uh, be in awe at it. Um, I think to do that, you have to interpret science as, the, as something I said before, the more we know, the more we don't know. The Japanese have a saying that explains this. They talk about as the radius of knowledge expands, the circumference of ignorance increases. And I imagine that as like a laser beam of knowledge going out into these days deep out of space and going in far further than we ever have with genetics and molecular biology to vast deep inner space. And if you imagine that like a light beam, and then you see that the further out it goes, the bigger the circumference of the darkness it's opened up. 
And so the more that we see that, the more that we know that we don't know, and we stand in amazement, wonder, and awe before, before both what we learn and what we learn that we don't know. And um, the difference between that and, for example, people like Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, is Richard thinks that eventually science will be able to explain everything. I certainly do not think that. I think that there it's far more wondrous, awesome out, and amazing out there than we can ever fully understand. So the wonder equation, which I've actually added a component to since the paper was published, is um, AWA plus in brackets S and then S minus uh, N and um, oh, something else, uh, N and anyway, we won't worry about that, gives rise to um, uh, G plus um, gratitude. I can't remember it. Anyway, what it is, it's amazement, wonder, and awe. Minor, plus scepticism, sorry, plus scepticism, that is, don't be gullible, question these things, you know, just because it seems amazing, but scepticism minus nihilism and cynicism, that's what it is, gives rise to gratitude plus optimism plus hope, that is G plus O plus H, optimism is the one I've added recently, and that gives rise to ethics. That if we if we take all of that into account and then try to decide what it is ethical to do, and very importantly, not ethical <clears throat> to do, I think we'll be okay. But we've really got to you know be careful with that. And some of the interesting research that's coming out from the social psychologists has to do with they did an experiment where they got people to go for a 15-minute walk each day and they selected two groups of people who were more or less, they were, they were controlled, they were similar and of age and physical ability and all that and men and women, et cetera. And then they questioned the uh, one group, they told just go for a 15-minute walk no instructions. The other group, they told, go for a 15-minute walk and look at nature and think about the trees that you walk. They put them both groups in a park and, you know, think about what you see and, and what you think about that. And they found amazing differences at the end. The, the control group that just went for a walk didn't have any experiences of amazement, wonder and awe and thought that they'd been told to do this because exercise was good for them. And the other group came back and they had all these, like, you know, perceptions and feelings and mysticism and that. So, you know, this is, we, we can't just rely on people coming in contact with what they need by accident. We have to actually consciously think about what we as humans need and how we can give as many people as possible those experiences. And they are experiences of transcendence, of feeling that you belong to something larger than yourself, that you've got a human history. I think that's why we want to know about who our ancestors were. Uh, I talk a lot about collective human memory, which is another way of describing history. And we've got to think about the people we'll leave when we leave this planet and what they need and our obligations to them. And I call that collective human imagination. What If we do A, what will be the consequences for the future? If we do B, what will be the consequences? And what is the what are the reasons that we should do A and not B? That's really what we're talking about. And this this um, emergence of the transcendent or experiential component or, or element in ethics is also affecting. You've argued that it's affecting the 
the, the, the pendulum conception we have of values between, say, conservative and progressive. And you've actually argued that well, we need to abandon the pendulum model and think in terms of values in, in more of a helix uh, model, that we can, uh, we, can have, we can adopt different positions according to the particular issue that we're considering. Do you think that's a realistic way of doing ethics, the helix model? I think it's the only way, Peter. And uh, the reason I'm against the pendulum model is because it puts a bunch of conservatives usually on one side and a bunch of so-called progressives on the other side. And then it sees as a swinging back and forth between them. And uh, the helix model says no, uh, We've, I mean, accompanying those images is another concept I've developed that I call value packages. So, for example, I think one reason why politics is so difficult to predict these days is that it used to be that if you knew a person had one conservative value, you could reasonably assume they had a whole package of conservative values. And similarly, for secular or progressive values. Today, that is not how it is. People have got what I call mixed values packages. So we could be progressive on one thing. For example, I'm progressive on dealing with climate change, but I'm conservative on euthanasia. And other people have got different packages. And in, in understanding that, it means that we don't just pigeonhole people and say, well, I'll never agree with you. This is to do with crossing the divides and solving the conflict as well. And it, it's a, what you find is that you can agree. I mean, there's one really interesting example in Europe where uh, people who were very much uh, pro-life on abortion and so anti-abortion and feminists who were pro what they call reproductive rights and therefore very much pro-choice found that they both agreed that surrogate motherhood was wrong and should not be allowed. And so they got together in the European, uh, I think it was the European Parliament, and, and said, you know, we agree on no surrogate motherhood. And that's what the helix allows. If you imagine it as two strands, you uh, first of all, you go up the helix and you reach a point where you start to return to the other side. But the, that's a natural uh, limitation within it. And um, But then you've got to look down and see what you've left behind and whether you still need some of that. That's collective human memory. And you've got to look forward and say, if we do this, what's going to be the consequences? That's collective human imagination. And then you've also got to look at the other strand and see, are there people over there who will agree with me on this? like surrogate motherhood, but disagree with me on that, which is abortion, for example. And so I think, you know, that idea that there can be connections between the two stands, strands of the helix and that, you, that values are not static, that they're evolving and that you're constantly working to make them evolve in an ethical direction is a very important concept. And it would be very helpful, it seems to me, if we could move towards a more uh, a, a, a greater fluidity in ethical discourse rather than digging ourselves into positions which we defend relentlessly uh, and determinedly, if we could uh, adopt a more fluid approach and understand that there are there are more variables. We might want to call it fuzzy ethics in a way that there are there are just different approaches, and people can take, as you've said, people can take different positions on. Um, on, on different issues. I think it's a very significant development for the way in which we do ethics. Peter, I, I voted um, early in the election and uh, I had a difficult decision to make because I, for the Senate, I actually voted for somebody uh, whose position on climate change I totally agree with and whose positions on euthanasia and abortion, I totally disagree with. And, you know, if 
And what I decided was that I think at the moment there's not a lot we can do to change what's happened with the abortion law and the euthanasia law. So I decided that I was ethically justified in giving priority to voting for somebody who was going to try and do something, as my colleague put it, because she was astonished I'd done this. I said, I want to save the koalas. And I do, <laughs> I want to save the koalas. Yeah, that's great. Margaret, there's one qu final question I'd like to ask you, which just takes us into a slightly different area. Um, it's about technology, because given advances in technology and the, the impact that they're having on health and healthcare um, through things such as the so-called wearables, such as fitness trackers and smartwatches, which are transforming uh, not only medicine, but also the relationship between patient and doctor. I wonder what impact do you think this kind of technological development is likely to have on the way that we do ethics in the future and bioethics, your own sphere of expertise in particular? Yeah, it's a really good question, Peter. They are talking about whether you could actually program robots to make ethical decisions. They're also talking about, um, you know, what do you put into self-driving cars in terms of if there's an inevitable uh, decision to be made about where do you crash and who do you hurt. Um, I think we will always have to keep a human element in this. Uh, one thing that worries me is how becoming to medicine in particular is how we're totally medicalizing life, that medicine has replaced religion. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, in a way what religion gives a lot of people is a belief that there is something else beyond this life and that they will have whatever that something else is. And I think what medicine's doing is giving a temporary reprieve from death and everybody thinks that if they use this technology, you know, they, they won't be immortal, but they'll have, a bit, they'll have longer on this earth. Um, and then you've got the transhumanists who promote that we can become immortal on this earth. I mean, it's a completely utopian philosophy. And uh, uh, I've had something to do with them over the years. When they, they first called me in uh, Montreal at McGill University, to ask me to speak at a conference. And it was the first transhumanist conference. And we're talking about something like 2011. I might have even been earlier. And they happened to call on April the 1st. And when they said, look, you know, we're the transhumanists, I didn't even know what they were. And then I said, well, can you tell me what that society is? So they went ahead to explain. Uh, and they said, and we'd like to invite you to be one of the opening speakers at our conference. Uh, they said, we've got an organisation called Better Humans, and Better Humans is having its first international conference uh, in Toronto. And I said, well, I have to think about it. And um, I got off the phone and I said to one of my colleagues, I'm not falling for that. I said, I know this is somebody who thinks, you know, they'll ask me to speak on something outrageous and I'll say yes. And <laughs> I went on the internet and put in transhumanism and it came up with 15,000 sites you could go to. And now it's millions. And they deliberately, because I, I freaked out about this. I went to the conference and I spoke at it and I freaked out about it. And um, they, um, they spoke to me. They had two questions. One was, why are almost all our members men and we can't attract any women to the movement, which I thought was interesting. And what can we do not to scare people because they all react with great fear to what we want to do? And um, I, I didn't know what the answer to the first question was. I said, I just thought perhaps women were just more sensitive and sensible. 
But I said, with the second question, what they decided to do, they said, we think that promising people a longer lifespan and eventual immortality will attract them to the movement. And uh, so they then developed these doctrines of life prolongation and age retardation. And they have had conferences on uh, making the average human lifespan 150 years and what's the ethics of that. And uh, that, that's life prolongation where you get, you use medicine to the nth degree and um, you, you know, artificial organs and animal organs and whatever. And age retardation is that when you are an embryo, they've identified the genes for aging. You go in and you reprogram those genes in that embryo so that you would reach puberty at about 40 years of age and young adulthood sort of probably around 80 to 90, and you'd have a very extended life. So... You know, these things are being talked about. Um, you keep thinking it couldn't happen and the next thing you know it is happening. And so I think we, I, I don't want to be a Luddite. I've been accused of being, I've been accused of being all sorts of things, <laughs> <laughs> including when I was in Canada, the one group of people who were very angry with me said, we're really glad that she's Australian. I'm also Canadian, by the way. But we're very glad she's Australian because we can deport her. We'll send her back to Australia. So here I am, Peter. <laughs> well, it's been great to have you. And on that transhuman note, we're going to need to leave it. Margaret Somerville, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to have your company for this fascinating conversation. Thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure. For decades, the CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound classical liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved.